Throughout this Lenten season, we are exploring the theme together, being human. There are few stories in our sacred texts that remind us of our humanity quite as much as the narrative from Genesis, particularly the third chapter. And so we are borrowing a, lection, a reading from last week's lectionary for our focus today. And I will read to you not nine verses quite incompletely commending you to read the entire first four chapters of the book of Genesis through the week. But today, hear now God's word as it comes to us from the second chapter of Genesis, verses 15 through 17, and the third chapter, verses 1 through 7. Listen to God's word. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. The serpent said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, oh, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the trees in the, that is in the middle of the garden nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, your word reminds us that you are God and we are not. Yet your word holds fast to the steadfast nature of your gracious love for us. And so in your grace, draw near to us and open our eyes and ears and hearts and minds that we might hear you speaking to us calling us forward, giving us new life. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts may it be acceptable to you, O oh God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So in the seventh grade, I was the only girl who raised her hand when our teacher asked for volunteers to read scripture for a school-wide mass. It was our class's turn to take the lead, and five students raised our hands. And so our teacher, in their seventh grade religion teacher wisdom, invited us to audition for the role. We would stand before our religion class and read the third chapter of Genesis, and our classmates would vote by applause. All right, with a round of applause, is there anyone here who thinks this is going to go well? <laughs> nope. So, when it was my turn to read, three of the four boys who were my competitors in this audition space heckled me as I read the text of Genesis chapter 3. They talked over my voice, and they name-called, and they laughed that kind of scoffing laugh, like, can you believe this? 
as I read the text. They made faces to intimidate me. You know those faces that kids are really good at making where they look at someone and then they look at you as if they know better than you. They booed when it was time to vote. And so our teacher, in a distorted effort at diplomacy in this fallen world in which we live, divided up the text from which the five of us read. One boy was the narrator, one boy was the serpent, one boy was Adam, and one boy was the voice of God. And I was Eve. It is a classic story, isn't it? Now, so, of course, I want to talk about how it was bad form that the bullies were rewarded for their actions, and I want to name that even after misbehaving, theirs was the voice of God. I, well, oh, and I forgot to turn off my train whistle of my, because this is a broken and fallen world, so now you know if you hear a train whistle, it's my text messages going on. <laughs> So, back to the story. <laughs> I wanted to complain that how even though I was the one to take the high road, who kept on reading through tears, who never booed or heckled my competitors, I had to authorize my own voice. No one stood up for me. I had to stick to my wits whenever well, I was going to use a nitwit whenever they would not, um, when they were trying to get me to quiet down, and I had to take whatever scraps were handed to me in the end, even if it was the smallest part. But this is not about me. <laughs> or is it? So let's, let's face it, friends. There is something about Eve's story that has become woven into the story of womankind, and I identify as a woman. And so whether we like it or not, Eve's story has shaped our opinion and our understanding of women throughout history as far as this origin story has been heard. And while I can't and won't speak on behalf of any religious tradition outside of my own, which may claim this narrative as part of their sacred text, it is evident within Christianity and Christendom alike that Eve's reputation like, has rubbed off on us. The first to succumb to temptation, the first to question, the first to doubt, the first to sin. Eve's actions, we are told, knocked over the first domino in the story of humans' estrangement from God. Eve opened the gateway for sin to enter the world. She disobeyed. She lied. She hid. Now, whether you believe that Eve was a real person situated in space and time or whether you believe that she was an allegorical figure who, along with Adam, became an archetype for humanity. This familiar story and its familiar Western Christian interpretation has laid the groundwork for generations of thinking about women. The idea of Eve as second-born has been used to fuel arguments around a woman's societal and relational subordination to a man. And when it comes to decision-making, Eve's reputation falls flat. Her, po her poor choice has been fodder for arguments to limit or remove altogether a woman's ability to make her own decision for herself in the realm of economics, or politics, or relationships, or even over her own body. She is tempter and tempted, deceived and deceiver. Her story becomes one stereotype of womanness, too weak to withstand temptation, too conniving to keep her mistakes to herself. 
Sure, 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 Adam ate the fruit too. He was exiled from Eden, from Eden along with Eve's. Yes, there are consequences for actions. But our tradition redeems his place in Christ, the new Adam, who would heal all that had been broken. God would put on a male body and dwell among us. Christ would appoint men to lead his church. And when he made his way back to heaven, men would become God's mouthpieces on earth. Or so we've been taught. But this text itself and life in general is way more complicated than this. A closer read not only of the verses I read, but in fact of the entirety of the second and third chapters of Genesis and well all of the Hebrew and Greek scriptures affirm it. There is more to this story too than meets the eye. All right, I gladly would teach a Bible study on the broad range of interpretations of this passage and how they might challenge our perspectives on each of the characters and perhaps even of ourselves. We don't have time for that now, as compelling as that might be, so hear these words as a drop in the bucket of God's larger story. The words of the text in Hebrew and in English and its history of interpretation itself point to a wider view of these words that raise important possibilities for us. More study of this text may guide us away from our impulse to typecast Eve or to typecast women in her caricatured image. So one commentator, for example, Wilda Gaffney, points out that the Hebrew character mem at the end of the word is a common indicator of plurality. Correspondingly, adam often refers then to all of humanity. The Hebrew um, pronouns for male and female emerging later in the text. She also goes on to argue that before God's um, Surger, surgical procedure to create more than one human, humanity is known as Adam. And she goes on to say that the word Selah, that God removes as, is side, it's often translated as rib. Gaffney argues that this translation of God removing a rib from one to form another is, does not hold up when the Hebrew texts are examined. She says there is no other place in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew scriptures in which Selah is translated as rib. And so she argues that this word means that God is removing a side of Adam, putting the creature to sleep, dividing it in half, something like mitosis in cell division. And so she suggests a read of this text that suggests that Eve was not subordinate to Adam, was not created second, but rather that diversity within humanity occurred through one action. Eve and Adam, unique individuals, were created at the same time for one another's mutual company and edification. Diversity extends God's creativity and mercy. It does not generate a hierarchy or dominance. The language of our faith, however, has commonly been used to generate caricature, caricatured portraits of womanhood that are limited at best and harmful at worst. And because this and other stories are situated in scripture, any interpretation of the text that may reinforce bias or condone prejudice is seen as acceptable and perhaps even true. And it's not just Eve. For example, consider the story of Mary we heard earlier today, the mother of Jesus. When you line her up alongside Eve, you get a larger narrative of parallel poles of womanhood situated in scripture. One woman bearing the reputation of first to sin, 
the other that history has identified as sinless. One woman gave birth to humanity, the other bears God into the world. And then these two reputations become the two buckets into which women are easily divided and categorized, sinner and saint, vice, virtue. Yet even these two figures themselves have a more, are more complicated than their labels. Even within the canon of scripture, they are curious humans. They are intelligent. They are theologians who, in their questions and their choices, are not only striving to understand God for themselves, but who also interpret God for us so that we might understand God better. They feel layers of emotion, like doubt and wonder and gratitude and grief, and they are reasoned decision makers. They compel others, they raise awareness, they talk directly with God. And these women, too, bear the image of God. They are part of God's story, not as the underdogs society suggests. They are protected by angels. They are active agents of their lives. They are individual with, individuals with whom and through whom God works. They are beloved. Now today's Hebrew scripture lesson points out what we know to be true. We human beings are not God. Our understanding, even as it grows, is limited. Our perspectives of ourselves and others and even of God is flawed. We often choose that which goes against the will of God. That which not only hurts others, but hurts ourselves. We wrestle with the consequences of our own choices. We sin. We feel shame. But as a people of faith, one of the sins we must notice one of the sins of which we must repent is that we, as a church and a society, treat everyone who identifies as a woman as less than. We must articulate and expand our view of womanness, dismantling an understanding of a woman's identity as a part of a biological binary or an ideological one. Women are not cookie-cutter caricatures of vice, or virtue, a sin, or saintliness. Furthermore, as a people of faith, we must stop using our sacred texts to relegate women to second-hand citizenship, whether in the church or in the society in which we live, but rather we must enact the justice to which we are called as the body of Christ. That means we need to listen to listen to the voices that have been silenced or shoved to the margins, to all of them, including those of women. We must work for justice. And that means doing things like eliminating the wage gap and working harder still for BIPOC women whose pay gap remains statistically substantially lower than that of white women. And we must learn about and work to address the litany of human rights violations that affect women across the globe and also women right here in our community. Women who do not have access to clean water or education or health care or safety. Women who do not have access to bodily autonomy or political agency, economic independence or religious freedom or equal protection or treatment under the law. We must repent of our sins. We must repent of that which we do and have left undone as individuals while also naming how our action and inaction has contributed to the wounding and marginalization of women on a personal and systemic level. We must pay attention 
and engage, recognizing that systems of authority in which we put our trust often wound, wound women, as well as those who are differently abled, or those who are sexual or gender minorities, as well as people of color. And then we must look at the larger story. For if we keep on reading, we read of a God who stoops down and sews clothes together for Eve and Adam. Not because there was anything sinful about their unclothed bodies, but rather because God in love covers their shame with dignity. God ministers to their bodies and to their spirits. God cares for Eve and Adam even in their sin. God loves. Richard Rohr puts it like this. There is really no medicine for the existential shame apart from someone who possibly knows all of me and loves me anyway. The one who knows me in my nakedness and loves me despite, and maybe even because, as Teresa of Lisieux believed, is presented then as a divine seamstress who takes away shame and self-loathing and gives them and us back to ourselves. As we journey toward Easter, May we recognize the image of God in one another and see the beautiful creativity and fullness of God's image in the faces and insights and the needs of another, particularly those from whom we are quite different. And then may we partner with God as those who enact justice clothing all of humankind with dignity, caring for all people, especially those who have been dismissed or denied, ministering in love. May we, may we collaborate with one another and with God so that there will be no need for shame so that there will be no reason to hide, so that we all might know love, just love for all. May it be so. Amen.